Hey guys, I'm Katie. And I'm Alexis, and this is the Check Your Aesthetic Podcast. Hello. Hi, it's St. Patrick's Day week, guys. I'm a big St. Patrick's Day fan. Did you know that about me? I did not, but it kind of makes sense. You're very big, like Mardi Gras, like... I love a person, celebration. Not the I love a yeah. celebration. Yeah. I do group them together in my head. So in Baton Rouge, um, there is a St. Patrick's Day parade, and it's probably the biggest parade in Baton Rouge because during Mardi Gras, people are like elsewhere. There's more interesting places to be. But for St. Mm-hmm. Patrick's Day, like that's the most fun thing to do. And it's huge and it's so fun. And it's happening this weekend. They all are listening like next weekend now. Um, I cannot wait for it. I'm so excited. Um, I went to Target today. You'll hear later in the episode. Um, I went to Target today. To try. Uh, <laughs> I went for a watering can. And then my alternative purpose was to find an outfit for the parade. I did not, su- did not succeed. Um, but you got other stuff. Yeah, don't worry. I got a lot of bunch of other things I didn't need. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Love it. Yeah. Love it's it. a, su- it's you got some cute amazing. shorts though. I did. I Y'all, like there, there are some very cute uh, clothes going on at Target right now. But I'm very excited for St. Patrick's Day. I'm all for the pinching. If people aren't wearing green, I'm all for the... Uh, when I was in kindergarten, actually, one of my teachers, um, her birthday was on St. Patrick's Day. So she would like pretend she was uh, magic on St. Patrick's Day. And by that, I mean, like she would turn all the toilet water green by painting it. I mean, by using food coloring. And she also flew, like she told us she could fly and then she showed us, but it was really just like a double way mirror. It was awesome. She would turn green herself. It was awesome. Oh, it was instilled in me for since then for St. to love St. Patrick's Day. I believe my school did like the whole like green eggs and ham thing. It's just so fun. Like, that's so fun. Yeah. So Patrick say rocks. Mm-hmm. Like that you don't have to like. It, there's no stress. It's a no stress holiday. Only fun. No stress on St. Patrick's. Well, do you know what I mean? Like Thanksgiving like is like stressful. Like Christmas is like stressful. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. I thought you meant like literally nothing stressful can ever happen on St. Patrick's. Well, no, Day. but I just mean like those holidays like that yeah there's no there's no like drama surrounding yeah St. Patrick's Day like yeah you just go drink mm-hmm. like some sort of green drink and have fun and that's and it's like fun yeah so fun. I, I do agree with that I do agree with that mm-hmm. I just love holidays like that like Halloween fun I don't actually like Halloween I kind of lied Halloween scares me I like kind of hate Halloween it's scary y'all <laughs> I don't really hate it for being scary I think it's just kind of cute yeah I mean, but like you know even I mean? St. Patrick's Day, like Halloween, you have to decide what you're going to wear. You have to buy all the things for your costume. St. Patrick's Day, no. You pull something green out of your closet, something yeah. kind of green, you Festive. put it on. Mm-hmm. This Just, cup? Literally. What? Like you yeah. show up to work mm-hmm. and then you have fun and then you go get a green margarita, mm-hmm. which every margarita is green. So, well, well, not every margarita, but most. <laughs> Me going absolutely. <laughs> off on St. Patrick's Day. I would like to know, guys, I want you to go to our Instagram and I want you to put it somewhere. I don't know. Maybe we'll do a poll about your opinions on St. Patrick's Day. Are you a St. Patrick's Day fan? Do you think it's dumb? Do you think it's fun? Do you think it's stupid? Uh, Do you love it? I don't don't think it's like stupid and I don't hate it. I just kind of like don't have any feelings. Literally one of my coworkers like one of my coworkers sort of like yelled at me the other day because I didn't know what day St. Patrick's Day was. She's like, it's always the 17th. It's just like, like so fun. Okay. Like, I just love everything about it, honestly. Also, you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys. For everybody who is keeping up, none of you care. Rue is next, the day before St. Patrick's Day. She mm-hmm. is going to the vet and they're checking her. And if everything's all good, she gets to stop being on exercise restriction. Love it. Which is so exciting because you I guys can't know. Wait like, to meet room. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, guys, like we've been teasing a trip. It's coming at some point. Who knows? We still well, don't actually know. No, like we don't know. Like we don't know. We don't know. But it'll happen. <laughs> what? Yay. <laughs> Yay. Hey. Hey. Can't wait. When I like lay it. I'm going to Louisiana. We let's just say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but I land on the at the airport. We see each other. 
Hey. No, I actually have to tell you guys something. So now that you guys know that at some point Alexis is coming to Louisiana, I don't know. Like if you didn't think that, then like you, you're not smart. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't think that you're an idiot. Um, no, but she texted me a while back and she was like, I'm so excited for like the food in Louisiana. I was like, yeah, that's awesome. I was like, what are you like looking forward to? Uh, she said, uh, stop, stop. no, because she said, no because, no, because she said Dairy Queen and Cheesecake Factory because she actually said Dairy Queen and Cheesecake Factory. And I've told so many of my friends, this. Vermont. no, I've told so many of my friends this and they're like, I'm sorry. What? First of all, we don't have a Cheesecake Factory and I don't even know if we have a Dairy Queen. <laughs> second of all Louisiana has some of the best food in the country if you guys are listening and you don't know like crawfish boudin all the seafood um etouffee gumbo oysters um beignets there's just so much I said Alexis a really really long list I'm sorry cheesecake factory and dairy queen i said we will not be going to either of those but i can send you a list of a bunch of delicious food that we will be eating and then she was like no oh, i'm see- actually so much more excited now I was like- <laughs> hey see when you're from vermont <laughs> you just have this list in your head of like restaurants you've heard about that you've never gone to so it had it was not it was nothing against Louisiana it was just restaurants that I've been like oh yeah they're bad they're both bad literally people would like drive somewhere like to New York to go to a cheesecake factory like sorry that like I'm sorry that I sorry that I didn't grow up having cheesecake factories (laughs) I was about to say privilege, but then I realized I've never been to Cheesecake I'm Factory. Privileged. I've literally never been to Cheesecake Factory. You've never been to Cheesecake No! Um, well, then I guess I just thought it was more universal experience that I had to experience. Sorry. You can save the Cheesecake Factory for when you go visit someone else. Well, to be truthful, um, your girl be having some digestive issues with lactose, so it's probably, so probably best. shouldn't go. And that's also another thing. Dairy, dairy queen. literally Dairy Queen. <laughs> the two places I wanted to go it's were dairy Cheesecake queen. Factory and Dairy Queen. When Cheesecake literally <laughs> it obliterates me. Literally. And the, the only so. good thing at Dairy Queen is the blur- <laughs> Anyway. Um, I guess we should go ahead and just... Uh, tell people what this episode is as well as just uh stop talking so yeah <laughs> uh do you i've talked a lot would you like to introduce our guest today yes of course um <laughs> so we had emily literally going from shitten and fart and talk to <laughs> guest who was very smart and had a lot to say a lot of really good information um so we had <laughs> emily i can't Shitting and farting and talk. <laughs> Emily, I'm so sorry. Okay. We're so we had now. Emily. <laughs> we had Emily from Sometimes Sensible on. She is um, I guess you could say like a financial, a financial coach. Um, and she had we talked about um, I'm still struggling to get through this, but um we talked about um, financial wellness and kind of like the fear that a lot of people have surrounding money um, and saving and debt and everything Mm -hmm. um, and finances around being an entrepreneur, um, kind of getting into like more of a corporate career and Mm -hmm. uh, not debating, uh, negotiating, Negotiating. yeah, negotiating um, uh, salaries and stuff. So it was honestly like an information packed episode so yeah definitely it, keep watching keep listening <laughs> it, it would be good for anybody regardless of what career you want to go into this literally advice would literally apply to every every single person who is listening right now so yeah. um yeah and also I would like to preface by saying that I make myself sound like I don't know how to handle my money in the episode that's <laughs> not the case 
Um, I just sometimes think it's funny to exploit myself in that manner. Anyway, um, I hope you guys enjoy the episode and let's chat with Emily. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited. We're so excited. I was saying before, I could not know less about this. We've had... (laughs) We've had a bookkeeper come on the podcast before and we talked about taxes, but like, this is where I really need some help. Like, you know, I just spend my whole paycheck in like three days. So <laughs> like, I need, actually need some like for real help. Like this is bad. <laughs> Alexis is way better than me. Yeah. I was just about to say my dad listens to this podcast like every week and will usually text me mm-hmm. either that we were laughing too much in an episode or will give me uh crap that I have not mentioned him so dad here you go I mentioned you um he is really a large like reason of why I'm good with my money um and my mom too but yeah I think like how you're how you um grow up with money I think Mm -hmm. like has a lot to do with moving into when you're an adult and have to manage it yourself but yes I've always been ever since I was a kid it really wasn't even like my parents being like you need to but just like watching them I remember being handed like 20 bucks when I would go to the mall and all my friends would like spend something within like 20 minutes of being there and I would come back with like 15 I'd buy like a five dollar thing yeah Katie's camp can't really <laughs> like I don't spend more money than I have but I spend I you spend I, what money. she's got <laughs> I like a little retail therapy anyway <laughs> Emily for anybody who's like okay well who is Emily why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell everybody what you do and just a little bit about you okay cool uh so hi guys my name is Emily also known as sometimes sensible I always struggle to say the who I am because I feel like it's ever changing to be quite honest but yes. I guess to some I am a personal finance expert influencer blogger person but I really just am very in love with talking about money and I like to tell everyone that I want to help you become rich in all areas of life so that might be investing it might be budgeting it very well might be talking about uh, how much I've spent to get rid of my acne. And uh, if you're watching, <laughs> you'll see my chemical peel is one of the things that I have spent <laughs> to get rid of my acne. So um, I suppose that is the best I've got for, for what I am, a personal finance and wellness lover. <laughs> Love that. Love that. Okay, so for um, we talked a little bit before we started recording that most of our audience is kind of younger women in the entrepreneurial small business, you know, kind of field. Um, So growing up, I guess I kind of negated this whole question because I just talked about how my my family talked about money, but a lot of the time that's not the case. Um, So we love that you've done a really great job of kind of broaching that kind of uncomfortable conversation of money on social media. So what has the response been to that aspect of your content? You know, I think generally I will preface overwhelmingly good. Like Mm I I will say that like I get DMs all the time um, from women who are so happy to just like chat about money and, and have any kind of transparency around it. I do think that I don't know. I I can't say if this is just about money specifically or the whole being on social media in general, but it definitely like I have trolls. I feel like if the, I've definitely shared a lot of my journey of like not making a lot of money in school mm-hmm. to now I'm making like, I would say pretty good money um, as a few years post-grad and, you know, the years that I didn't make money and would show they're like, I can't believe you can live like this. Da, 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 da. They're mad about it. And then now that I spend a little bit more money, they're like, I can't believe this is so out of touch. Blah, blah, blah. So yeah. I think money is very, decisive and that it, right. it people have very strong guttural feelings about it um but overwhelmingly I think the response has been great and I really think like the best thing to come out of talking about money on social media really is the community and predominantly women I have looked in like almost 90 percent of my audience is, is women so it's it's mm-hmm. been great to kind of be able to share that yeah and I think obviously all young people it's kind of a touchy subject but I feel like especially for women I feel like we forget that it really, really was not that long ago that women literally weren't working. Like 
you know, in the grand scheme of the world. So I feel like it's really powerful to be able to like empower women to be comfortable to talk about money. That's why I'm so excited about this conversation. I want to, I want to know more about money. Um, but for somebody who's kind of early in their career, like you said, you go from literally making negative money in school, you're just paying, making no money, um, to, you know, making a little bit more money. Um, it can be kind of overwhelming to budget when you're first starting to actually make money. You don't Mm -hmm. know all the things that you need to be paying attention to all of the, you know, retirement insurance, like all of those kinds of things. Um, so just, I guess I know there's a lot that goes into this, but when somebody receives their first paycheck or just any paycheck, what are some Mm -hmm. systems Mm -hmm. that they should have in place to kind of allocate their money or what are the things that they really should be paying attention to? I feel like the best guiding principle when you're looking at your paycheck, and I'm going to say this and it sounds really simple, but it does really take a long time to master is the phrase pay yourself first. And Mm -hmm. you see it all over personal finance Instagram. Everyone's always talking about it, but it really is like a mental switch. And I feel like it sometimes gets dumbed down a little bit, but I really do think this is like the most powerful guiding principle you can have because getting your finances in order is extremely overwhelming. There's no short of of like information and stuff to read through and things that you can do and optimize and blah, blah, blah. But if you can just remember your North Star is pay yourself first. And what that means is by yourself, we're really talking about future you. So this is not like pay yourself retail therapy. I had a hard week first. This is more like (laughs) eye contact with Katie here. This is really thinking about yourself in 20 to 30 years, 40 years, whatever it might be, what does she need? And she's going to thank you for that later. And so depending on your situation, this might be like, you're going to pay your debt. You're going to set some side for retirement via investing. You're going to make sure that your emergency fund is kind of set up. And you're basically going through this priority list that is a little bit tailored towards you. Like, yes, there I there definitely is a little bit of like, everyone's going to have to do X, Y, Z, but then mm-hmm. it gets a little personal. Um, so, but if when you're doing your paycheck and you're looking like, okay, did I pay future me first and future me is those goals. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of go through, okay, well, I, I hit those goals. Now what's left over is for fun present me. Like that's your retail therapy. That's your going out to eat your drinks, whatever it might be. But if you can kind of put that future you first, it's really going to help you keep the North star of, of all of your financial goals, in my opinion. I love that. And I love what you said about like it kind of being different for everybody. I actually, I would like everybody to know, I, when I got my job, my first real job, I do put money in savings every paycheck. So I would just like everybody to know that that does happen. Um, So I'm not just like going crazy. Also, I don't make a lot of money at all. I work part-time. So (laughs) anyway, you are in school also. Yes, yes, yes. But um, I think like for me, I like, I guess what I put aside is kind of an emergency fund, but I think of it as like, if my dog has to have a surgery or something like, and I put a certain amount aside for her in that big chunk so that Mm -hmm, I can mm -hmm. pay for the things I need to pay for, for her, but for somebody else, it might be completely different. And I think something that a lot of people kind of our age have is debt, whether it's from school or just from anything. And I think that's obviously something that scares a lot of people. That's how I got my start was, uh, yeah, my, yeah. my big thing was I like came out on, on the internet and was like, I have almost $200,000 of debt. Let's Whoa. chat. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's amazing. And, and I feel like yeah. that's such an overwhelming thing. I've actually seen a lot of people on TikTok recently talking about debt. Yes. Um, Libby, Libby B. I, I don't remember what her username is now. I don't remember if it's changed. Um, Libby B on the label. Is that still what it is? Yeah. yeah. So she um, is doing like, each month, how much she paid towards her student debt that month. Um, Mm -hmm. and she has some interesting conversations in her comments. Some people are mean, but as they always are, (laughs) I'm scared of TikTok. (laughs) TikTok is like uh, crazy. If you think that if you get hate on Instagram, TikTok's like absolutely unhinged, but I do think that's a good conversation to kind of have. And obviously $200,000 of debt sounds like you would never pay that off your whole life. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, um, it was, uh, it was a lot. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So I, I was a, um, unique, like middle schooler on Pinterest saving, um, percentages, like a percentage breakdown of like what your budget should be as like, a oh my eighth God. Grader. um, <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I don't even remember where they, those went, but I'm very curious if you have kind of like a 
a breakdown, like a general breakdown of what you think, like, obviously, as you said, it's going to be very personal and very individual, but what mm-hmm. is like, what should be going into, like, what percentage should you be paying for your living expenses? What should be going towards food, like that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, I think that there's a lot of like very prescriptive budgets out there that try to Mm -hmm. to hit on this, like the 50, 30, 20 kind of deal, like um, 50%, you know, can be for your living expenses and and everything like that. And 30% um, savings and 20 and so on. And, you know, I think that they are a good place to start if you Mm -hmm. aren't totally sure. But I, I do think I might more of the camp of like, what are your goals? Like, and I say this because I am very much on the retire early train. Like that is Mm -hmm. my central focus. I'm like, I am not working in my Mm -hmm. (laughs) forties. I don't want to. Um, and so for me, that 50, 30, 20, or like a lot of the things that you'll kind of see on New York times, you know, blah, 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 recommend this budget. It wouldn't cut it for me. I'm not going to be investing enough. I'm not Mm -hmm. like, you know, kind of gearing myself up for that. And so I think that I'm, giving you a little bit of the worst answer to give, which is that it depends. I know everyone hates it. It depends, but, um, I feel like, yeah. And I feel like the best thing to do is to kind of just sit down. And I think one of the first things that kind of helps me frame all of my financial goals is like, when do I want to retire? Like, what does that, what does that look like for me? And I think that there's a crisis with especially the millennial generation right now, just like Mm -hmm. everyone is so sick of it. We're like, we kind of just want to be done. And so you'll see this retire early movement is like just gaining traction and traction, but bringing it back, I think to the question is like, sit down and write down your like goals. So if you want to, if we're talking about retirement, which I think is a good framework to put everything in, like Mm -hmm. sit down and be like, how much do I need to live my life? And it's actually a pretty simple formula. You can be like, if you need, I think, oh God, I'm going to do mental math, which is always bad, but um, like $60,000 a year. And you're like, that's my super comfortable money uh, number money. Then you could just take that and multiply it by 25. And oh God, I think that 60K times 25 is a million. But essentially that being that the idea is if you had a million dollars in investments, then you could withdraw from that pull down every year and not run out of money if you're just pulling out 60,000. Now, if you start to go crazy and pull out 70,000, this math doesn't work. But if you're like, (laughs) I just want the 60,000. So then it's like you have this North star of like, okay, I'm working towards a million in the bank. That means that I need to backtrack and need to invest this much every month. And if you have high interest debt, you got to get out of that because you can't retire with a bunch of credit card debt. Like that's Mm -hmm. not going to work. It's going to cut into your 60K. So this is what I mean by you're kind of slowly framing it out for yourself. And you're saying that, okay, now that I know I need to invest $300 every month, you know, what else is there to being me? What's going to make me happy? And so kind of just going that way and and making a priority list. I always tell people that I think the moment that you can identify what really brings you joy and what really adds value to your life, like for me, it's food. um, Yeah. Then you can redo your budget a little bit because I think we get really hung up on like, you have to spend in all these different categories and these templates you like download from the internet, you know, whatever. But if you're like, I just love food, then spend a bunch of money on food. Don't spend a bunch of money on clothes. And now you have a budget that is working for you and you're investing $300 every month. So this is very roundabout. It depends and make a priority list. And that's going to help you with this. Yeah. So talking about like, I'm interested in re like when you think just what your recommendation would be for when you should reevaluate your budget. Because I feel like obviously when you get a new job and you're making a different amount of money, but kind of when are the times that you look Mm -hmm. at everything and be like, okay, is this working for me? Or is this like not? Every month I sit down and review your, and it depends on like what your pay schedule is like. But for me, I like to do things monthly. Um, And so every single week I look at my budget and I update it to be like, oh yeah, we're still on track with the plan we made. And then every month is different. Like this month, for example, I knew that I had to spend a little bit less on food takeout because I'm going to see my best friend in Ohio, which means I've Mm -hmm. got some extra expenses. That's kind of, you know, unique to March. Mm -hmm. And so every month it changes. And if you try to fit your life in this like template that you don't update, you know, maybe once a year, you're going to be really frustrated and you're likely never going to meet it. And then you're going to get burnt out and you're never going to budget again, which is what I see a lot of people happen. So I say that every single month or when something changes, and even if it changes on the fly. Like I had a 
client who she was really stressed out. She had a birthday party come out out of nowhere. She's like, I had to spend this much money and now I'm over. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We'll just remix a little bit. Like, it's fine. You're, you're good. And if you go over a little bit this month, then we'll look at next month and balance things out. So yeah, your budget should be very fluid and should be ever changing in my opinion. Okay. Need to hear that. Never budgeted in my entire life. One time I tried to make a budget, but I didn't even know where to begin. Now, granted, okay, we're going to talk after this. I'm, I'm I, worried. No, I like, I need, no, I like, need, <laughs> like I, need help. I mean, like I, I'm making myself sound like a absolute mess. I'm not spending more than I have. I just kind of have no rhyme or reason to the way that I'm doing things. Like it's always worked should, out for me, check. but I do need a plan. Like, and I'm getting to the age where I, where I, I need a plan. I need you're to also an emotion, need you're, plan. you're also an emotional spender. Hush, this is Me not too. therapy. <laughs> I I am too. I am too. It's no, okay. I, yeah, I, big thing. Yeah. yeah. And you can, I feel like you totally can be in those like different aspects. Like some people go out and buy clothes. Some people go out and buy food. Like, yeah, it's all so personal. Um, but so, I mean, I think the whole time, this whole interview, we've been talking about how intimidating money, um, can can be. Um, and especially when you're starting to think about as many of our listeners are, when you're starting to think about like an entrepreneurial kind of Mm -hmm, venture. mm -hmm. Um, so what are some options if someone is thinking about having rather than, you know, a small Etsy shop that they can, you know, start up with like $500, but let's say even you don't have that $500 to spend. Um, what are some options to help in those early stages of a business to fund that venture? Yeah. And I will preface this, that my business is pretty much all digital. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the advice I have is very unique to running a digital business, which is drastically different than if you have a physical good, it's, it's much more difficult. And I I think I also want to state that like, it's, I feel like this is going to sound a little harsh, but I feel like in a lot of the things that I hear, everyone's like, jump in, start your business. There's never the right time, blah, blah, blah. It's all very positive. And I do agree. Like truly there never is a right time. You're always going to feel like anything yeah, that you're feels scary. You're always going to have excuses. Yeah. But at the same time, we have to be a little bit reasonable. Like yeah. I see all of these like Gary V kind of entrepreneurs. They're like, if you have a plan B, get out of the room. And I'm like, bitch, of course I have a plan B. I'm trying to <laughs> retire still. Yeah, like, I, yeah, I do. I have backup plans. So right. I think that like, you can be very aspirational, very entrepreneurial and still be a little bit realistic. So in regards yeah. to saving up that $500, I mean, it's the same thing as like, there's no magic way to make money. If there was, right. this would be an entirely different podcast, but yeah. um, unfortunately you really do just have to like put your head down and try to save up a little money. And I think that a lot of the ways to do that, if you're not making it, if, you know, for me, example, if you're working a nine to five and you're not going to be able to save that up on your nine to five or something, then think of like a creative thing that you like to do. Like a lot of the times it's jog walking or Mm -hmm. it's babysitting or it's reselling things you don't, you know, wear anymore on Poshmark or Mercari or whatever, like the the money that you're trying to save up for your business doesn't have to be made while doing the business. Like if you've got to do some undesirable jobs for a while, like, you know, bartending or whatever it might be that you don't want to do for a long time, then do it. That should be that. Like, if you want to start a business, I hope you have enough drive to, you know, bartend for a little bit to make the money for it. Cause Mm -hmm. you're going to hit some harder roads, um, than, than raising $500 probably, but there's no magic way. And I don't think that people, I just like to try to put out a little air of responsibility into the yeah. internet sometimes with the entrepreneurship yeah. thing. Cause I hear a lot of horror stories of, you know, I cashed out my Roth IRA to start mm-hmm. my business and it failed. And now I have no retirement. And I'm yeah. like, I love the hustle. I love the ambition, but we've got to have like a little bit yeah. of so some kind like of guiding light. Risk. Yeah. yeah. My boss actually, um, at the agency that I work at, she's talked about this before, um, on podcasts and stuff, but she actually tutored all through college and saved every single dollar she made from that and used it all to start her business. So, yes. and I, I like that I'm, again, I've made myself sound like a, um, <laughs> terrible, like spending in debt. I have no debt. everyone. I have no debt. I'm not a mess. I just like sometimes spend like $20 more at target than I said I would frequently, you know, 
Like oh I my just God, twenty dollars more. <laughs> Damn, you're an inspiration. I walk out there with way more. Than $20 well, it's like like sometimes. I just like I have these plans in my head, and then like they just don't come true. So I definitely need a budget. But again, I'm not a mess. But um, I like personally, I'm taking the time that I'm in school to try and save some money for when yeah. I'm out of school. Um, so that's kind of the same thing. She did save, save money, um, tutored yeah. while she was in school. And I think that that is a good idea. I think that's much better advice than being like, take, take out a loan and just hope for the best. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cause yeah. I think and one, like putting your, getting yourself in debt is just dangerous. I agree. That's, that's hard to climb out of as someone who is ferociously climbing, um, <laughs> from her student loans. But, mm-hmm. and I also think there's so many creative ways to do it aside from things like I say this in the funny way because sometimes sensible is actually helping me fund a bigger business idea. So it's like, mm. did I, and I thought sometimes sensible would be the business that I would stop. And right. it's like, now maybe it's, you know, the stepping stone along the way to something else. So it's, it's always creative and interesting and will definitely change. So, yeah. And I also love what you said about no magic way to make money. Like I kind of feel like everybody's been in the position before at some point when they were like, does anyone need a babysitter right now? I need to be paid tonight. <laughs> like, you know, where you're like, I, you know, especially when you're in college, you're like, I really want to go out. I need a dress for the semi or whatever. And you're like, I would Googling like quick ways to make money. Um, so, <laughs> so I feel like that's why the planning right and all of that is important so that you can not have that happen to you. I'm talking to myself anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, okay. I feel like, um, a lot of times when people kind of do start that business, you know, it's starting to gain traction. There's mm-hmm. this kind of a different mindset of thinking like every cent that you make for your business needs to go right back and you need to be growing bigger and doing this and that. Like it needs to be, you know, you've, so you've got mm-hmm. a mid-sized business. Right. You're like, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think paying yourself is something that people don't talk about a lot. And I've haven't heard mm-hmm. much about until honestly, recently, um, talking to some of my like entrepreneurial friends about it. Uh, mm-hmm. So what are your thoughts on like paying yourself as a business owner? And like you said, obviously paying yourself in the form of like we talked about earlier, as well as like just out of that oh, yeah, big yeah. chunk, kind of what goes to you, what goes yeah. back into your business? I hundred percent pay myself out of my business. Like I should, I should say that I'm, I'm team pay yourself. Um, I think the accounting term is an owner's draw, fun fact that I learned the other day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a, I think it's a, a balance because if you pull all of your money out of your business and then you need to pay for something to help grow your business, you're kind of, you know, shut out of luck a little bit, mm-hmm. unless you're going to loan your business back the money, which I have yeah. done. Actually, I pulled too much out, got a little too spicy, and then had to give some money back to Sometime Sensible mm-hmm. recently. Um, so I, I think it's like, again, I hate giving that it depends answers, but I do think you have to make a priority list of like, what do you want to do with your business? Like if your business mm-hmm. is doing fine and you're comfortable where it is, not everyone needs to grow some big, bad behemoth of a company yeah. to be happy. Like if you're meeting the goals and you're happy with it, say your goal was 5k a month and you're doing that, pay yourself what you want and keep, keep chugging, like be happy. That's fine. But if you are like, I'm making 5k a month and I want to make 30k a month, I want to really have this big business. So, well, then you might need to like, take a look in and be like, I need this money to whether it's a new software or it's hiring. I haven't got to the stage yet where I hire anyone for some time since school, but I will say all of my entrepreneurial Um, friends and podcasts that I listen to it's like the number one like most given tip I feel like the moment they hire hired out things is the moment their business really began to grow Mm -hmm. and you can't do that if you're taking all the business out because you have to pay those people so I I think it again is a list of priorities and what do you want to get out of your business and then that will help you kind of decide how much you want to take out and when you want to take out yeah definitely yeah I I love that you said that the, the hiring someone because Katie and I recently hired an assistant and she yes. was so correct that like instantly a lot was off of our backs and has helped us in like so many so many ways um but I also like how you said I feel like in all aspects of your like financial life that you just need to set priorities for yourself and kind of mm-hmm. since it is so personal both in in a personal sense of like, you know, how much do you want to be spending on food, travel, 
you know, saving for a house. Maybe you don't even ever want to buy a house. You know, it's all very yeah. individual. But I also think that that applies to entrepreneurial like paths. Um, mm-hmm. Since you are the one that's running your business, um, you get to make those decisions. You get to um, choose what to do in the future. You know, you get to choose like Katie and I, Katie and I haven't talked about if we're going to talk about this, but really all of our sponsor money is going towards trips for the two of us. Um, so like right now, I mean, we pay ourselves, but we pay ourselves in trips. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, that's kind of a choice that we had to make and, you know, decide together. So I like, I like that idea of like priorities. Um, but so kind of, again, the fear of money. I feel like it's like a looming thing, (laughs) like a looming topic. Um, What advice would you give to people just in general that are kind of scared of money and scared of finances to get a little bit more comfortable discussing it and kind of broaching that subject? Yeah, I think that there are two paths. Like if you're really scared to start talking about it, start reading about it on your own. I feel like Mm -hmm. that's the most easy unintimidating way is like curled up in bed at night you're totally alone no one's gonna know like start googling money stuff Mm -hmm. um I feel like I made it sound like we're googling porn but it's just (laughs) um so yeah you can kind of start just like I feel like there's a few books like one of the I will say the most recommended like beginner book is I will teach you to be rich by Rami Sethi he does like a job of just kind of like a crash course and everything So get your feet underneath you a little bit. Um, But my favorite way, to be honest, is talking to my girlfriends about stuff. Like if there is ever anything that I'm unsure of, like, I don't know, I know that they are so non-judgmental and it's like so much easier to talk to them over wine than it is to read a bunch on my own. Um, So if you have a circle of friends that you're feeling pretty comfortable with, like just start broaching it like, hey, how much do you make? Hey, mm-hmm. do you have a tip yeah. for a negotiation? And I feel like the how much do you make might be like a big leap for some people and some friend right. groups if you're not used to it, but you can start small, like, hey, how are, do you budget? Like, you know, right. how did you negotiate, blah, blah, blah. Do you have any mm-hmm. tips for me on this? And and then you can kind of like start building that muscle. And I think once you get a little comfortable, like truly your friends and the circle around you is where I tend to learn the most. And so totally a lot of my friends agree. are entrepreneurs and also financially minded so is my boyfriend so like surrounded by like a little money crew I suppose and so I learned so much from them yeah I I like that you said that also because not to bring up my dad again and dad hopefully you're not listening (laughs) at this point um but I think I like that you said like peers um because I think that obviously you know we learn a lot of habits from our parents, whether good or bad. But I also think in the future, a lot of the times people go to their parents for advice, which obviously is like, you know, still a good thing. But I think at the same time, they come from a very different generation. A lot of them are not entrepreneurs. So they don't understand that aspect in the sense of Katie and I, like they're not in the creative field. Um, like our parents aren't so I think that having like when you have those conversations with your parents literally last night I was talking to my dad about career and I was just like yeah mm -hmm." Mm -hmm. um (laughs) no offense dad um but like love the opinions but of course like you're gonna know more about your field than like your parent is unless they are literally in that same exact field and still at the same time they are most likely 20 plus years older than you so it's you know um yeah but yeah I really like that of kind of knowing what knowing what peers are doing um yeah and getting and also I feel like it, it kind of has that comfortability level mm-hmm. since it's people that you already trust and know yeah yeah and I I don't want to discount the parents out there. There's some great tidbits. To yeah, get from, yeah, no, definitely. I think <laughs> I'm going to offend Alexis's dad right now, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not listening anymore. But I do think um, a lot of the clients I actually have will kind of come in with some stuff that, oh, my dad, blah, blah. And one yeah. thing I have to say, I cannot wait until my kid's generation, when my kids are going to go around. My mom taught me how to invest. I just... Yeah, I have to throw that in there. I I feel like every time it's always my dad taught me this. And I'm like, 
Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, a tangent, but I do think you're right that a lot of the issues that millennials and the Gen Z generation are going to face financially are so much different than what our parents face. Like, for example, the high housing crisis and the student loan crisis that we have in the U.S. I mean, like they I don't think fully understand how our financial habits have to be different to mm -hmm. account for that. Like the whole thing of, you know, I think one of the big things that everyone says on personal finance internet is, um, oh, just stop buying Starbucks and, yeah. and you can, you know, everything will magically get better. And, and you yeah. always see the people I'm like, excuse me, $5 times five times, you know, four weeks in the year. And da, 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 da. this is still only a few thousand dollars. Do you know how much a house yeah. costs? Like yeah. for anyone who yeah. doesn't live in LA for me to buy a house out here, I will have to have probably at least like one or 2 million, like yeah. realistically yeah. $2 million and $3 million if I want to live in the current neighborhood that I live in. So yeah. Yeah. Even though I don't drink Starbucks, it's not going to cut it. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, like, that's not going to, that's not going to be the deciding factor. No. Not. Starbucks yeah. is not, or avocado <laughs> toast, which is the other one that me oh up, but that really yeah. became a thing. But, but yeah, some, summing up, I, I do think like your, your peers and also use good judgment. Like, I feel like this is the lame, like advice your mom gave you, but they're like, if Timmy ran off the cliff, would you run off the cliff too? And I'm like, no mom, I wouldn't run off the cliff. Like yeah. the same thing right. with finance. Like just because I'm saying to talk to your peers, a lot of peers will have very bad habits as well. Exactly. And if something sounds too good to be true or a little bit fishy, use good job right. judgment as yeah. well. <laughs> I also, I really like what you said about kind of maybe like not even talking to your friends. If you don't want to talk to them about how they spend their money, I think it can be really useful to talk to them about how much they make if they're in a similar field to you. Because it one of the most oh, intimidating yeah. things to me is like, me and Alexis were actually talking about this the other day. I have very little, like I've recently been learning it in grad school and stuff, but I, when you Google, how much does a blank make, you're getting so such a range you're getting, you know, like if you Google, how much mm -hmm. does a lawyer make, you can, I mean, you're getting this, it, so many different options. It depends on so many things. It depends on where you live, what kind of law you practice, you know, and then for every job, it just depends on so many things. So I think having friends who are kind of in a similar field is saying like, if you're comfortable telling me, like, how much do you make? How did you get paid that much? You know, did you, yeah. did you negotiate? How did you negotiate? Cause that is, especially as a woman, we know what, like women literally yeah. get paid less than men. So For like, everything. yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, um, negotiating something that's especially hard. And, uh, from what I've gathered part of the reason that women get paid yeah. less than men. So I think talking about that, um, even just like the, how much do you make side rather than how do you spend what you make, I think is important too. Oh, hundred percent. And I will say that one of the biggest like tips that's helped me and just my general financial journey and increasing my net worth is focusing on earning more and not necessarily spending less, which yeah. is mm. very much the opposite of what women are taught, which I know yeah. men are taught to earn more and not spend less, but us women keep on clipping is the way to be rich if it's not. Um, yeah. But I will say really quick back to the negotiation and figuring out like how much you're worth kind of deal. This is something I've become like super passionate about. So like on my page, for example, I do every week share my salary where it's like my followers will tell anonymously like where they live, what their title is, like how much they make. And I like share them all and like keep them to highlight so people can come back to them. That's but an amazing. even better resource than my Instagram page, unfortunately, <laughs> is um, Fishbowl is, is an app. I actually, they are fantastic and they are like an anonymous salary company career sharing platform where you can log in and say like, Alexis, you might want to work for Google and you're like Google in Los Angeles for this specific role. Like, what is it making? You can literally go in, type all this down and it's going to like filter people who are working at Google or have worked at Google and they're wow. talking about their salary, what their bonuses are, what their compensation for this and that and benefits and la da da. And it's all anonymous. So people get real mm -hmm. frank, which is great in this yeah. uh, scenario. Yeah. And you can kind of go through and, and gather a little bit of data there because it can be very difficult especially if you're in a very niche position to find like data online just readily on yeah. like last door or something like that yeah and in yeah. my experience like a lot of times um obviously i have not had many jobs but i kind of assumed that it was like this is how much you're going to get paid do you accept or decline but there's often a <laughs> lot of conversation about like yeah. you know what are you what's you, what are you you know 
how much money, what's, what salary are you comfortable with? So you got to make sure you know how to answer that or else you're going to get dig yourself in a little hole and then they're going to be like, yes, we can get her for cheap. Also the wording and like kind of the, like the, the, I guess, emotion behind that and the the confidence that you have to have in order um, to do that. That's something I love about uh, my, I'm in grad school um, at SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. And that's something I love about my school is that they're so focused on getting people jobs after mm-hmm. graduating um, and talking to them about how to interview, how to ask for a raise, how to ask for mm-hmm. a certain compensation level. But also I wanted to um, shit on Glassdoor a little bit. Um, literally yesterday or maybe the day before, um, I just like look at jobs for fun. Um, and there was a range that was 30K to 140K. <laughs> what? That. Yeah, LinkedIn LinkedIn does this too, where yeah, where the ranges are pretty pretty wild, and and I think yeah. too the one thing I want to say before we totally stray away from this topic is it's not just sa- salary is not the only form of compensation, and I think yeah. that when yeah. you're fresh out of grad school, like they don't do a good job of telling you this. For mm-hmm. example, my current position actually paid me 20k less on my flat salary than what I wanted, so I went in saying like I want this much, and they. They gave me this and I was like, okay, well, because you did that, I'm going to get my compensation in other forms. So like there's signing bonuses, there's annual bonuses, yeah. there's education, training, different perks, things like that. So just like a myriad of different benefits yeah. that equate yeah. to different forms of compensation. Like don't sleep on your 401k match, like look at yeah. it. And if it's, if there is none or there's crappy one versus if there's a really great one, that's a lot of money over your yeah. working career. So yeah. all this to say that there are very, very more, like way more forms of compensation than the salary when you're, when you're negotiating a job. And most of the time, I will say it's about two negotiations back in my experience. So they throw out something I'll say, how about this? They'll throw something out and I might even counter again. So Mm -hmm. you should always counter at least once, like never just accept. Mm -hmm. Um, And I usually try to counter at least two times and across different things. So I might be countering a salary and a signing bonus at the same time, which is what I just did at my last job. So, and they expect it. Just, yeah. just so everyone yeah, yeah. knows. Like, I think that's they, so important to think, like, to know because it's so scary. Like, you, I personally, like, before I really like started to look into things, I thought like, oh, if you counter, they're gonna be like, never mind. But that's yeah, they won't. Yeah, if it's they normal. made you an offer, they want you. They're lowballing you. you. I think. Like, don't they lowball you on purpose so that? Yeah, isn't that the whole true, reason yeah. women get paid less? Yeah, and a, a lot <laughs> yeah, of the time, big brain. <laughs> what I've what I've learned through like workshops at SCAD is a lot of the time that like emotional like confidence kind of aspect actually bodes well for asking for like you know negotiating a contract because it shows that you know your worth it shows that you have initiative to and kind of have those uncomfortable conversations so even though it seems I think like you said Katie as women we are taught to no don't talk about it it's Mm -hmm. it's okay yeah mm -hmm." Mm -hmm. um but actually, in reality, I think, in the, and of course, I'm making a generalization, but I think in a generalized sense, um, it can actually, in many ways, be a, a benefit to you to um, counter with a different oh, yeah. Um, yeah. salary. And also, I, I know that a lot of um, publicly traded companies or like larger companies will also give you a stock option, which I think yeah. is a, a cool option as well. Which is a a huge part of compensation depending where you depending work. On the size, yeah. Yeah. A friend who paid off her entire student loans on her stock from, from her company and, and yeah. just selling that stock and things like that. So it can be quite quite large. And and then I I also would add to that I think the other really big thing, one of the reasons I think at least that women get paid less too is that we are inherently a little bit more loyal and emotional Mm -hmm. to our jobs and I think some of our male counterparts are like if we get hired somewhere we're like well xyz mentored me and they gave me this shot and and we'll put up with all this shit because we're like I have this false sense of loyalty for this person or this company that 
quite honestly would replace me in 10 minutes if yeah. it came down to it probably. And so I have a friend who's like, she announced one year, she was like, I am no longer having any loyalty for anywhere I work. I go where <laughs> the money goes and that is that. Yeah. And oh, she got a lot of like heat for it by people being like, well, this and da, 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 and they didn't like it. And they're like, well, where's your sense of loyalty? And your job is da, 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 and all this stuff. And I have to say, I agree with her. And I have taken on this mentality too. Like I will work 12 hours a day for my own business. I will not work 12 hours a day for someone else's business. And yeah. I will do really hard and I work really well and I like exceed my expectations. But like, if someone else is going to give me a better job offer. Yeah. Yeah. I had a friend recently who worked at a job um, and she accepted another job that was higher pay and she kind of didn't like her work environment either. When she went in to mm-hmm. quit, her boss essentially said like, your generation like has no loyalty. Like you, you, it's going to look horrible if you didn't stay at a job for like over a year. Like you haven't even been here a year. Like that looks terrible. Like everybody in your generation's like that. She really unloaded on her. Um, but I just think that's like, if someone makes you a better offer, okay. Tell the next person that you're interviewing with, why did you quit this job after however long somebody made me a better offer? Yeah. And it's, it's also more common, I think, depending on what industry you're in, I will say in the tech industry, which is um, predominantly where I work, it's very common to kind of hop around between the big competitors and and things like that for the sign bonuses and for the better offers. And that's why you see companies like Netflix, which is like one of the highest rated places to work and places to get paid companies is because they know that they know that top talent is worth a fortune in the market. And so they pay above market and they encourage their employees to go out and interview. And if they get a better offer, the CEO of Netflix says, come to me, tell me what it is. I'll match it. Yeah. If I want to keep you, I'll match it. Wow. And that is like, you know, that to me is like, that's where I want to work. Like yeah. I don't yeah. buy into the whole, when your boss is like, we're like a family. No, we're not. I have yeah, a family. Right. This is a job. Right. Yeah. 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 I think that's really important. And um, definitely for people who might just be entering the workforce, I think that things like that are just confusing. And I think yeah, can be easily, yeah. not necessarily manipulated on purpose, but with, you know, m- maybe accidentally. I don't, I don't and know. I don't want to sound... I feel like I'm going to sound, people are going to listen to this like, God, this girl's a bitch, but <laughs> really, <laughs> no, no. you, I will say you should read the Netflix um, co-founder, Reed Hastings has a really great book called No Rules Rules. And he says, I think it's in that book that they say this. And one of the best analogies I heard um, is don't treat your job like a family, treat it like a team. Yeah. You like your teammates, like in the yeah. NBA or whatever it is, like they play well together. They are loyal to each other, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, they're doing a job. And if another team trades them or gives them a better offer, they're going to go. And yeah. it's no hard feelings. Like you can still be friends with your, your old teammates, your current teammates. Like you mm-hmm. show up, you do the best of your ability, but at the end of the day, it's still a job, not yeah. a family. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Um, That's definitely a great mentality. Yeah. I, I yeah. Like I said, I think that it can just be hard to understand kind of the dynamics of how a workplace are supposed to work. So I feel like that's good. I think especially when you're young, like when you're getting out of like out of school and especially like the only real experiences that you have are with other students or your Mm -hmm. roommates or your family. So Mm -hmm. having that boundary um, is something that's definitely learned. So yeah. I feel like this is a new series I'm going to do on Instagram now. Like DM me if you're curious about if this is normal at your job and I can yeah. tell you if your job <laughs> is shit or if this is normal. You do a question box. You're like, what is the weird shit that happens at your job? <laughs> <laughs> what? We'll rate them on leave this toxic or this is normal. It's fine. <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh my God. Okay. So I guess to wrap everything up, um, this is just a very broad question. I know you've mentioned some books and stuff throughout, but do you have any resources that you use um, for systems or programs or anything that would be just like your best recommendations for people to start with to take control over their finances? Yeah, I think that for me, I love blogs and social media. So I think the number one thing to do is just start following some really great money creators that you align with. And, Mm -hmm. you know, my hint here is if you open up their page and if they make you feel bad about something, that's not the right creator for you. Um, There are a ton of really amazing 
um, especially like female finance creators out there um, that I love. So I would say start there. Social media is the best way, in my opinion, because it's like a nice slow drip too. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's yeah. not super overwhelming, but like, right. oh my God, I have to read this whole book. Yeah, so just right. get a slow drip of topics and just have someone kind of on your phone constantly chirping about money in some form or fashion, which is great. And then I think as far as like systems, if you're really, really new, one of the ones that I like is Mint because it's free and Mm -hmm. it's a budgeting tool. So you can kind of just like connect your credit cards and it's going to start tracking. And it's, I won't say it's a perfect system. Like a lot of the time it doesn't get the categories right. Like, you know, if it's obvious, it will, it's a restaurant, it'll know it's food kind of deal. Um, But at least it's getting you used to having some kind of system on your phone. That's like, Hey, you said you only wanted to spend $200 on blah. You spent three heads up. Yeah. Um, and then as you progress, I think the other thing that I will say that is really great is do a course or some coaching. And this is my shameless plug that I do both and that my course is launching hopefully in like a month if I can get my <laughs> act together. But, mm-hmm. um, but truly there are so many amazing, like, again, female money coaches out there, uh, who do an amazing job. And I think the going rate is anywhere from like 120 to 150 bucks for an hour for Mm -hmm. one-on-one coaching. And Mm -hmm. a lot of the time people who are just getting like their financial journey started bulk at that. And they're like, oh my God, that's like a lot of money. But let me tell you in one hour of talking to someone about getting your finances together, they could help you save thousands of dollars. Like truly thousands. I have clients who we did like two sessions. She's like, oh my God. I got all the step paid off and started investing in da, 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 and the whole life is like completely turned around and things like that. Wow. And that's not to toot my own horn. That's to say that like, I really think that a lot of people kind of go through this like struggle phase where they're like, I'm going to learn it on my own. And then they don't. And then they're like, oh, I'm going to do it. And then they don't. Whereas if you just sat down with someone who does this like all day and talked for an hour, that could really jumpstart your like journey and yeah. help you get all the things together. So yeah. there's that option. Then I think if you want something more comprehensive, there are many phenomenal financial courses out there right now. That's also a really great way to kind of just get like an all comprehensive view of everything. And I like those because I feel like the people who make these, and I'm speaking from experience, have spent years reading IRS.gov. Yeah. yeah. And I promise you, it's not fun, even for yeah, me. The kind of thing you would uh, literally just never do yourself, ever. Never want to do. <laughs> yeah, and no. you can literally just, it's like the same thing of I pay my hair stylist to go get my hair done, because Lord knows if I tried to do it myself, mm, right? It is not. <laughs> be is fried not off. No more hair. Yeah. It, exactly. So, I think to start with, those are probably my best. So like social media, um, Mint is a good resource if you're like, I just need to get started on a budget or go look up your creators on social media who you're following. Most of them are like myself and they'll have like templates for budgeting that they sell, coaching courses, things that they're doing to kind of um, promote their own businesses and stuff like that. And then books is my other thing, which are kind of hard because I've kind of fallen off on a lot of books recently, but there are lots of good ones. Amazing. All right. Well, let's get into random question. Just random question. Mm-hmm. We only have one today. Okay. Um, <laughs> so this one is what is the hardest thing for you to not spend your money on? So like what, if you're going over your budget, like what would it be on one? Emily, you can start. I think I know what you're going to say. <laughs> I have two, um, okay. definitely food. Yeah. <laughs> I am an emo. This is so bad. I'm an emotional spender and an emotional eater. And it always is on food. Like if I'm having a bad day. I'm in bed and I'm getting DoorDash pasta or something terrible. I was me. literally thinking about that today. I was like, it's been a rough day. I yep. want to get uh DoorDash. <laughs> A hundred percent. And then the other one for me, which is also, I feel like has to do with my emotional spending is that it's some kind of self-care thing. So I'm mm-hmm. big on like mm-hmm. massages or a workout class or mm-hmm. like a facial or something like that. And if I'm really just feeling in a rut, I'm like, ah, I'm just going to get a facial and then everything's going to be better, which is not true, but it makes me feel fixed. like everything's going to be better. So yeah, those are my big ones. I get that. Alexis. Yeah. Um, I would definitely agree with food. Um, and it's funny because a lot of the time we think emotional eating is like a bad thing, but with me, I can definitely be both. Um, when I was, I, my undergrad degree was, uh, education. And so I had to do student teaching and my student teaching advisor ended up getting pregnant, like pretty early into my, um, student teaching semester. So I was alone a lot of the time. Um, and that was an emotional roller coaster for me. 
Um, so there were good days and bad days and both on the very best day and the very like worst day, I would go to the grocery store and get sushi and a slice of cake every single time. I love and, that. Yeah. And it ended up being a lot. <laughs> but I would go get sushi and cake and I'd be like, oh, well, I had a really shit day. I'm going to go get sushi and cake. And then two days later, that day was awesome. Let's go get some sushi and cake. Yeah, that had to stop, but it didn't for a little while. So, yeah. Well, that's me. Um, mine is, and I, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. Of course, this is not the question, but what I would want to spend my money on is not what I actually spend my money on. So, like, if I was like, yeah, yeah like I would love to be overspending on experiences. That's something that I think mm-hmm. is like very worth it. Like, going mm-hmm. on trips or like doing something with friends, but instead I'm buying myself sushi at Whole Foods like way too often. Like, <laughs> listen, that's an experience. Like this is my, it is an experience. It is, it is an experience, experience. Yeah. but I, yes. I hear you. I hear you. We yeah, want a but better, like, better experience. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> whenever it comes to like down to it and somebody says, do you want to go to a concert? I'm like, I don't have the money for a concert ticket right now, but then like, you know, but I would say whenever, right. whenever I retail therapy myself, it's usually like shoes, clothes, you know, some, Target. some sort of wearable uh, thing. Yeah. Usually from Target or just like literally like go, like sometimes I just go to Target and I have nothing I need. Yeah. Why? Oh yeah. Oh, like yeah. nothing I need. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, most people are like, Oh, I went in for one thing. I'm like, no, I'm going in for nothing. For nothing. <laughs> I'm going in for nothing and I'm going in and it's going to speak to me and tell me what I need. Anyway, I also recently have been overspending on like dog toys because I've only had my dog for like six months. And so I'm like, she needs to have a rain jacket. Yep. She my needs dog has a pajamas. Wardrobe. Yeah. It's just like, she doesn't need that, but that would, mm-hmm. that would be mine. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us, Emily. Yes, I learned a lot and I am going to uh, stalk your page now so I can learn even more and become a money <laughs> genius. Um, but why don't you go ahead and plug yourself, tell everybody where they can find you online. Yeah. Thanks so much guys. Um, so I am predominantly on Instagram. It's at sometimes sensible and I am just starting TikTok. God help me. I'm very nervous about it. It's scary. But also at sometimes sensible. Yeah. I've got one video up and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to do it's another scary, one yet. It's scary, but it's worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> it is. We'll, we'll not, there. Don't look at the comments. <laughs> right. Come, come show me love on TikTok. I'm going to need it there more than yes, anything. Please. Um, <laughs> and then I also have, I just completely redid my website. So the blog is coming back soon, but it'll be yeah. at sometimesensible.com. I know I'm really excited. So I'm basically sometimes sensible everywhere to be amazing. Awesome. Well, that makes it easy. Um, well, thank you guys for listening. Be sure to leave us a rating and review on wherever you listen to your podcast. This is your friendly reminder that you can rate us on Spotify now, um, and subscribe to keep up with our weekly episodes. And then follow us on TikTok at Check Your Aesthetic and over on Instagram at Check Your Aesthetic Podcast and our personal accounts, Sometimes Sensible and Katie Creative Co. and Alexis Adams Aldrich. And we will talk to you next week. Bye, guys.